Hi, Mage of the Podcast fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson, along with co-host Adam Simpson. And we have a bit of a special episode for you today. If you are hearing this the weekend of April 13th, Gods and Monsters and Familiar Strangers has just dropped. And we have four, count them, four of the authors involved in that project on this call to discuss their work. If each of you could take turns introducing yourself and telling the audience a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Start with Isabel. My name is Isabella L. Price, and one of the writers that was brought on, I came on to focus more on the African, Yoruba, Haitian, and Voodoo side section of the book. This is my first time writing a, a, an RPG book, and I'm, I'm super excited. I mostly do horror writing, short horror stories, uh, horror critiques, burlesque, a bunch of different kinds of stuff <laughs> I guess I could go into later, but, but yeah. That's that's me. And those of you listening cannot see it, but Isabella has absolutely gorgeous mage purple nails at current. And hopefully <laughs> we can have a, a screenshot afterwards to show that. I believe they do strength plus two aggravated damage. Uh, <laughs> Prime enhanced. Yeah. <laughs> James, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm James. Uh, I'm credited under this book as James uh, Sambrano, but also I write under JF High. And I was brought on to the project to write a lot of the indigenous American stuff that was going on with it. And I also did like some like Americana horror a little bit in there, too. And uh, like the the whole the, the big owl stuff started with a story that I told. So like that was pretty central as well. I write short stories right now, though. I'm trying to finish books and mostly my my stuff is horror. So Hiromi, care to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Hiromi Kota. I, uh, somewhat of a fledgling author, I guess. I w- initially started on with Disparate Alliance before it got any sort of traction, and it's been backburnered for the foreseeable future. Hopefully we get back into it, because there's lots of lovely stuff there. I am primarily actor, and, well, no, I'm not primarily anything. I'm an actor, voice actor, programmer, producer, I, if it's a way to tell a story, I'll do it. So I was brought on for this specific book so that we could get a little bit more of the Asian and Pacific Islander sides. This book, I am fairly certain, is the first time that Okinawan folklore has been presented in a major RPG, which, since I'm Okinawan, that's particularly important to me. For listeners who are not quite sure what Okinawan is, it is an indigenous community of the southern Japanese islands. We got annexed about 100 years ago, and no one made Japan give them back. So now we're probably more Japanese than not, but uh, we have a rich culture and brought that into the book, as well as the various flavors of Polynesian, uh, Japanese, Korean, Chinese cultures. I would have liked to have gotten into the Philippines, but we can't make the book bigger. <laughs> yeah, at, at a critical point, Onyx Path is a company that produces glorious doorstops, and uh, that needs to be reined in a little. And our final person on the call is uh, l- line developer and granddaddy of Mage, Sater. Uh, yeah, Sadros Phil Bricado, a.k.a. Phil Bricado, a.k.a. Sater. I've been handling Mage since 1993, after the first edition came out. Uh, handled it from uh, 1993, sorry. Handled it from 1993 to 1998-99. Left White Wolf in, uh, in 99. Came back for occasional guest appearances and then uh, got involved with Onyx Path on Werewolf 20th anniversary. And uh, the books keep getting bigger since then. I am a writer, musician, former actor, occasional DJ, and have written professional professionally in pretty much every medium that you get a paycheck for writing in. I've written self-help books. I've written porn. I've written film. <laughs> I've written films, TV, and comics. But games is where I'm most no- what I'm most known for doing. And how is your car? Ah, much better now. Yes. And I also, I really, really want to thank, and thank you for asking. I really want to thank all of the, the, the friends and fans who threw in our GoFundMe about two weeks ago when uh, uh, my wife Sandra and I, are <laughs> we went out one morning to find the car wasn't working anymore. So oh, no. $2,500 later, she works fine, needed a new battery, and it's a Prius. So replacing the main battery is pricey, but I highly recommend for anyone who's in Seattle 
Seattle, My Mechanic Automotive on Aurora. They did a marvelous job for us, and they treated us really well. And the car's great. First Mate's the podcast sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess uh, for a little bit of background, this is the fourth book. Uh, the art book and the anthology also, and the uh, the screen and the quick and the quick start. So I think it's actually about book seven. <laughs> The fourth that includes large amounts of core system, I'll say, um, (laughs) of publications that could have come out next. How did this one get chosen as the project that was on deck? Well, originally, when uh, Rich and I were, Rich Thomas, the head of Onyx Path, Rich and I were brainstorming stretch goals for Mage 20. We had no idea the, uh, the Kickstarter campaign would go as well as it did. Uh, so came up with a number of books, kind of a wish list of what I would love to do for Mage. And then we blew through a good portion of that wish list in the first few days. So I started adding things and suddenly found we realized three weeks into the campaign that we were going to be doing fulfillment for five years or so just on the uh, the stretch goals alone. So we ended up having to cut things back <laughs> in, in order to, to not be committed to, you know, 10, 12, 15 books. The originally Gods and Monsters began as what were supposed to have been three mini books that I was going to be writing, which was going to be um, mage, char- you know, mage characters, companion characters, and god, spirit, and monster characters. As the Kickstarter ramped up <laughs> through the course of the campaign, Rich and I came up with the idea, and Mike, Mike Cheney, the art director, came up with the idea of combining those together into a single book. And originally, I'd founded that book with about 35,000 words of uh, material that uh, John Sneed and I had written for Mage 20 that needed to be cut. And then I was going to be writing the book myself. And after the Book of Secrets, which is 237,000, something absurd like that, I started feeling really, really burnt out. Also, the discussion around the time that I started working on this, it was all like, I'm just going to write these books because that's quicker and easier for me to just do it. But then the the discussion about getting people involved in uh, in writing their own stories became more and more uh, more and more common. I thought, you know, I shouldn't write this book by myself. There should be other people involved in this. And James and I had been talking about that. James was uh, part of my design team on Mage 20. And uh, Hiromi and I have been friends for a while. And we just started talking. Next thing I'm like, you know, I think I'm just going to add these other people to the book and make it a more expensive, more diverse book than what we originally had in mind. There were several smaller books, or in the case of Disparate Alliance, larger books that we also had planned, but... But uh, when, when we initially did Mage 20, the, the Kickstarter, CCP owned the, the intellectual property rights. During the time that we were working on Mage 20, Paradox bought the IP out from, from CCP, and that changed our relationship with the intellectual property. There were several books that they said, no, we don't want that, or not yet, or we may be taking Mage back any time now. So what Rich and I decided to do was just produce the books that were promised as stretch goals for the Kickstarter. Hello, Cupid. And the last of those promised stretch goals is cur- is, is the Book of the Fallen, which is currently an illustration. The Book of Everything Hurts All the Time. Oh, God, that book hurt to write. So that's a whole other subject. <laughs> I, I hope it's a good kind of hurt. One of the key ideas in this book is that it brings in voices, opinions, viewpoints, and worldviews that just really weren't previously fleshed out in Mage for Hiromi Isabella and James, what do you feel for the for the sections that, that you wound up writing? What was your goal? What did you wish for the reader to know in that statistically it's probably a white kid between the ages of 18 and 35? Like, what was your hope and what they would walk away from? And what, I guess, misunderstandings were you trying to correct in terms of how that culture or group of people was viewed? So I'll, I'll go ahead. One of the main things that I was asked to do, Seder and I know each other from horror conventions and talking about different things. And I've always been very vocal about my uh, history, my family history in from Louisiana and, and the American South and how I have family members that do root magic and other kind of voodoo practices. And and I've been kind of a vocal, I'll say black person. I'm trying to not say POC so much because POC, uh, when I'm specifically talking about being black, I need to say black Mm -hmm. people instead of just this like amorphous POC thing because I'm talking about black issues. 
And being a black person in kind of the horror gaming nerd space, I'm trying to put myself more out there. And so one of the things when we initially started to talk about what this project was going to look like, you know, I was I was very straightforward. Like, I do not want to do stereotypes. We're not going to do Haitian voodoo doctors. We're not going to do cannibalism. We're not going to do, you know, poppets or anything like that. Like, if we're going to have a conversation about African deities, African gods, how that relates to voodoo and, and African traditions, let's have a conversation about the, the actual thing and not the pop culture, serpent in the rainbow kind of uh, an idea about it that was kind of my my main goal because I can't remember if we had just if Sarah and I had just met after I had written this piece about the mishistory of zombies and about how zombie lore has been misrepresented from its traditional African background and how the traditional the the historically accurate depiction of zombies is much more broad and interesting than the kind of you know are they fast or are they slow kind of uh, version that we're used to in the modern era and you know it's things like that that I I was really like, we're going to, I'm going to tell you the truth and not the pop culture. Cause right now, you know, pop culture knows zombies. They know voodoo doctors. They know American horror story coven. Like it's, it's become this, the depictions of Africans as savages, as cannibals. It's a really twisted Eurocentric view of this amazing culture. And with my family being so involved in it and coming from a, a long line of, it's called root magic, which is not exactly voodoo, but it's a combination that's a little bit more domestic than voodoo. It's a little bit less a amorphous. And so coming from a long line of women who practice magic and being a writer and trying to be more visible as a black woman in this space. And Sayer was 100% on board with everything. <laughs> Everything I told him, I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And he was like, that's great. That's perfect. Let's do that. And so, you know, listening to me so much was was really was really great because I didn't want to do stereotypes and caricatures because it causes more harm than it does anything else. And you brought in a lot of the of families that were part of traditional Loa. And mm -hmm. what was interesting to me as someone who tries to do their homework, I uh, for the listeners, this book came out yesterday. I took the day off work. I read it. Wow. Um, I kind of just shotgunned it. I thought it was interesting that you pushed back against the syncretization of the various figures and how they are often mapped onto Christianity. I thought that was an interesting conscious choice. What was, was it just a case of you wanted to make sure they had their own space? Or do you think there's something that syncretization or that mapping process gets fundamentally wrong? It's interesting because so much of the Loa being combined with Christianity is a, it, it was a survival technique that slaves did in order to preserve their own traditions. So in order to have their traditions not taken over by their white Christian masters, they sort of, they changed the names, they changed some of the personalities some of the characteristics in order to, to keep that tradition alive. And so for me, it was much more interesting to have a focus on these actual African deities because we know the pantheon, we know the Greek pantheon, you know, we know Thor and Odin and Loki uh, and all the other Avengers. Uh, um, you know, we know, <laughs> we know all of those people, but there's a whole pantheon of specifically West African gods. I didn't really want to go too much into, I don't know if you know this, but Africa is like gigantic and uh, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of other countries, but I focus specifically on West Africa because that's where most of the slaves came from. And so that's where most of the traditions came from. And there's a whole pantheon of amazing gods with great personalities and backgrounds and it's really been a passion project of mine to talk more and introduce more of those gods into that pantheon not just for the game but also for people's references for the references of i mean this was before the american gods tv show came out and so you know which the american gods tv show has a lot of african deities in it and so it was something that i purposefully tried to do and if you had another 4,000 words to work with, would you, would you just fill that out more? Or is this oh a case, God, yeah. should, should we expect a storyteller vault supplement for this? 
I... Yeah, I would do. God, there's just so much. There's so much. There's so many monsters. Uh, I'm a big. What is uh, colloquially and casually known as a, a, a monster fucker. I'm a big. I'm a big monster fucker. I love monsters, and so being able to focus on African monsters was a really exciting sort of a thing. You know, being able to bring that history in and and that lore, because Africa has a lot of really awesome, amazing, gross, terrifying, weird, scary monsters. And we only know about a handful of like Western kind of monsters. And so if I could, God, I mean, there's just so much and the gods have so much drama, you know, like there's just there's so much more material that I could do. So yeah. Yeah, you have a continent of several hundred million people and you look at the yeah. background of less than 45 million of them. Exactly. Yeah. It's a big place. Africa is a big place. And it's not just one country. Spoiler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what is it? 53? Uh, I guess with the addition of South Sudan. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is the part where I'm going to have to like edit something in ex post facto. But uh, James, or, <laughs> James or Hiromi? I, I vote for Hiromi. All right. Yeah. And just because we're throwing in fun African facts, I'm going to throw in one that I ended up coming up into a while back that blows everyone's mind when I bring it up. So there is no city in France that has the most francophones. That, that honor is now Kinshasa. Kinshasa has the most French speakers of any city in the world. I believe it. Great <laughs> colonialism. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Yeah, right? Um, my goal with Gods and Monsters was the basically impossible task of Asia isn't one thing is what I wanted to hammer in, which is really difficult when you have the Yaogai, the Yokai, and the uh, Yokwe, which are all the same and they're not. Like the divisions between Japanese, Korean, and Chinese, calling the monsters as being overly, overly general, but they blend categories so deeply that it's really hard to get away from the term. I wanted to pull at those threads and to try to help people identify like this, this kind of creature is coming from here and that they have a distinct place inside the Asian ecosystem. But at the same time, Asia is not one specific entity. Like they have different regions that they occupy and some of these creatures really only stick around in one place like Oni and Tengu and uh, Tanuki, they're, they're very specifically Japanese. Similarly, Shisa and Kijimuna, they're very specifically Okinawan. Other things like heavy... Did you come to the table with the linguistic backgrounds for those? Or was that something where like, step one, learn 17 languages? <laughs> so being Okinawan, Japanese, I grew up with like Japanese building blocks where, where there'd be like hiragana on one side and katakana on the other side. It wasn't until university that I got any real fluency with the language. Uh, and I still can't read newspapers because no one can read Japanese newspapers. <laughs> they are ridiculously dense and they will help you in no way. But so like I, I had a background for Japanese. I had somewhat of a background in Korean, uh, having lived and worked there for about two and a half years. Partly I was stationed there while I was in the army, and then I went back and worked there as an English teacher before getting my master's in teaching. My master's is also mainly applied linguistics, so being able to dig into languages and figure out where my weaknesses are and how I can shore those up. Even Chinese is not one thing. Like, Chinese is eight languages in a trench coat that the Chinese government wants to insist is one thing that it's really not. <laughs> and that completely glosses over the hundreds of smaller dialects that end up getting crammed into those eight categories. To answer your question in a shorter way, I had a foot in the door, but more research is always required. With Pacific Islander, a lot of times people will get into the concept of Pacific Islander as kind of this one amorphous thing. When really Really, they generally mean Polynesian. And even when they're talking about Polynesia, that's an area that stretches for basically the entire width of the Pacific Ocean. Talking about just one facet of them is really difficult to do. I, I hoped like hell that I managed to bring that across as best as possible, especially since I couldn't even get into the Melanesian islands because that's there's not enough words. So like uh, Fiji and Tongo have like just amazing stories to tell. But when we have 
words constraints talking about the Pacific Islands, I get to talk about two cultures, the Yukuan culture and the Polynesian culture. But my goal was that that would be enough to kind of break the perception that Asia is one thing, is all one thing, and that Pacific Islanders are all one thing. James? Okay, so... The same question they both answered, right? Yep. What were the misconceptions you were trying to fix? What did you want to bring to the table? And if you want to talk about what did your research look like? So Sater and I had been talking about this book for a really long time before it even got started. Basically, as soon as the Kickstarter was successful, I think we started talking a little bit about it. And Disparate Alliance, too. I was part of that conversation, too, before that got shelved. When he talked with me about it, the, the thing that he said to me that he that kept coming back to me was that he didn't want to just make a, like... Uh, a book of monsters he wanted to tell a story with that book he wanted to have a theme an idea of what people are dealing with in like i guess the quote-unquote real world reflected through these you know magical uh, creatures and gods and stuff like that and so because i had in my hands kind of uh, the responsibility of handling indigenous stories throughout both north and south america that's like there was no way I was going to cover what needs to be covered. But my approach was in like, instead of like focusing on a region or, or specific things, I chose a couple things that I was personally familiar with from my, from my own tribal background, but also I picked, which is where Big Owl and La Huseta come from. Can you give a quick background on what Big Owl is? By the time this goes out, most people haven't gotten it, to it yet. Well, first of all, Big Owl is the, the lovely gentleman on the cover of the book. The story, the general story, like you can read the book, right? But like the general story, it's an Apache story and it's essentially... If you want to compare it to other worldwide mythos, it's a it's a boogeyman story. But Big Owl is a creature who haunts the night and goes about finding people to kidnap and take back to his children to feed them. And his children are always hungry and his children are always growing. That seems to be a recurring theme in the book. There's a lot of things out there in the shadows that are going to eat you. It's almost as if every culture kind of has a fear of the dark in some way. Yeah, that's what I mean when, like, Seder told me, like, let's have a let's have a story and a theme behind this. At one point, I don't remember exactly when this was in the development of the book, but, you know, you mentioned there's, like, there's a ton of authors on this book, but at one point, Seder called literally the four of us together in, a, in physical real space in Seattle at, at Isabella's place, actually, at her theater. And we sat down together and, like, hashed out what we wanted this book to look like. And we did come back to the theme of, like, like fear, fear and how fear transforms you, essentially. And that's kind of what Big Owl represents in a lot of ways. Big, Big Owl is fear. If you want to boil Big Owl down to one thing, Big Owl is fear. And, you know, it's in, he's infectious fear because he's also fear that can live inside of you and, and let you become something like him or something that serves him or just his food or just his children's food, I guess I should say. But anyway, that's that's a little bit off of like the actual origins of the Apache story. The origins of the Apache story were that, you know, we we have our big hero, um, killer of enemies who showed up and slayed all the monsters and Big Owl was one of the monsters he slayed. And when he did, Big Owl was dispersed into all of the owls in the world that you see today. So now when you like walk around at night and hear owl hooting, you know you better be afraid. Yeah, I like the, the, the rapid contrast between that owl and the owl that Athena has. Well, I have... <laughs> I have something I want to say about that because um, this is also – so the other theme that I traced into the stuff I was writing was the impact of colonialism. And throughout most of White Wolf mythos, not just mage but by and large like werewolf has this a lot and even to a degree vampire, Owl is shown to be a figure of knowledge – of wisdom and someone you can look to for 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 kind of like a spiritual guidance when you want to be more like educated and make good choices but in not not you know i can't speak for american indigenous culture as a conglomerate because it, it isn't in any way however there is a recurring theme throughout a lot of tribes that owls are representatives of death and i think it's an important statement to contrast those two because the idea that western wisdom and science came here but we saw death but they're kind of the same creature in a lot of ways it's one of those interesting contrasts like one of the things that always throws me off when i read about a, a new culture is the animal associations so you have the akan folklore where anansi the spider is the bringer of wisdom and then you have the idea of like cowardly lion um slinking through the savannah where to to westerners that is the symbol of courage 
Mm-hmm. Was there anything in particular you wanted to bring to the party, Seder? Well, uh, one of the things that, that James had just mentioned when we had that meeting was shortly after uh, the election in 2016. And what I wanted to do, looking at the, the just the psychic blowback, the intense, the, the cataclysm, really, on a lot of levels, the psychic cataclysm that followed what I call the Trump sanction, I said – this book needs to be about more than just a bunch of monsters. This this book needs to it needs to 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 speak to something deeper than that, and it needs to speak to what's going on right now. When the four of us originally was the four of us were the only authors. The uh, the other authors are brought in later for reasons of probably get into in a minute. When it was the four of us, I was just like, I don't want to be the one telling you all what to write. What do you want to write? What do we, what do the four of us want to make this book into? It needs to be more than just a collection of critters. And this is what we came up with. (laughs) There's already the bygone bestiary. There's already Ascension's right hand, and you didn't want this to be the monster manual for, for M20. That is exactly what I didn't want it to be, and that's and that that's one of the things we talked about. The and I, I guess we might as well, since we're talking about this, as people who have followed my blog and and who read the dedications in the uh, the books will probably already know. The end of 2017 was extraordinarily difficult for me personally. Uh, all of that period was, but especially the end of the year, because my girlfriend of 12 years, Coyote Coyote Ashley Ward, had been diagnosed with terminal cancer some years earlier. And, you know, 2017 was the, the last year of her life. And my close friend, Raven Bond, had had a heart attack right around the same year that that Coyote was diagnosed. And the two of them were two of the closest people in my life, and they both died the same week, the end of 2017. So I was a wreck. When the four of us, the four of us worked through most of 2016 to get the majority of the book together. And then when I got all of the drafts on my my desktop and started to work on them, my world fell apart. And I struggled with that for a few months. And finally, Rich said, we really need to get this book together. So that's that's the point where I brought in Jason and uh, Anthony and Adelante. And Matthew and Eddie came in as co-developers. Matthew brought in uh, uh, Josh. And I <laughs> tapped into my, uh, my, my alter ego, Cedar Blake, uh, who I've also published under uh, in, in sort of a way of getting around the uh, the emotional blocks that I was having about writing at the time. So combined, we we all kind of moved heaven and earth, and and the result is uh, is gods and monsters. And a book about things that move heaven and earth. So Cedar Blake does not exist as a separate person. No, Cedar Blake is. It could probably do a whole podcast on this subject. But the shorthand is that Cedar Cedar Blake is is. Uh, an aspect of my identity, and no, it's not multiple personality disorder. This is in a Jungian sense, but it was also uh, my pen name, and I have published under her name uh, several things. And occasionally, when I'm having problems emotionally getting through something, then I just go, "Okay, Bill slash Seder is getting out of the way. Cedar's going to take over, and boom, look, <laughs> she wrote a bunch of stuff. Let me give her credit." I very much liked her writing, so thank you for that. Um, thank you. So what were the parts that you were most proud of coming out the other end of it? This seemed like you, you talk about the timeline and boy, howdy, did it seem like a haul. Have you been able to look at the final thing? And is there that part where you go, I nailed this or alternatively, shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the shit, and I'm going to bring this one out right away because uh, the shit is the missing trait that no, that went past everybody until the book went to press. The fact that familiars don't have gnosis? Uh, no, actually, I left that out intentionally. Oh, okay. Uh, I would have been more clear about my phrasing had I been writing better at the time. But uh, no, gnos- the gnosis and rage stuff was left out because you're not supposed to be able to play spirits. Normally, I'm very good at thinking around corners, and I should have thought at that time that even if the players are not playing the characters, there should be a way to buy Rage and Gnosis for the familiars, but I just wasn't thinking around corners the way I usually do when I worked on that section. No, there was there was a size. Yeah, there's the size table that's not described. Not, and Josh and I both missed that one, and everybody involved in proofreading and oversight, including the backers on the Kickstarter thing, everybody missed it until the damn thing went to press. 